Um, I would like to introduce our third speaker and then we will break for lunch. Uh, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino is the Associate Professor, Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology from the University of South Florida, the Morisani College of Medicine and Research Science. He is going to talk about optimizing ketogenic nutrition for brain health. It was mouthful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Anne, for the invitation uh, to be here today. I want to thank the organizers and uh, the board for extending the invitation to me. Uh, hopefully, you all can hear me back there. Yeah, and, and I want to thank you all for being here, uh, especially the caretakers, because you guys are the people in the field. Uh, you know, in the trenches, you know, doing, doing the work. And uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit, uh, have some tough shoes to fill, <laughs> to follow. Uh, so I, my background is basic science research. I uh, actually majored in nutrition as an undergraduate at Rutgers University, and then went on to uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And I was in a PhD program where I studied neuroscience and I studied uh, physiology and sort of the integration of how the brain controls our physiology or the neural control of autonomic regulation scientifically. So uh, I went on to University of South Florida where I'm at now. I'm a tenured professor there and I teach medical students, uh, but I also have a position as a research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition where we do uh, some human studies. And uh, most of our research is funded by the Department of Defense and Office of Navy Research and also the Alzheimer's uh, Foundation funded uh, some projects that I'll be talking about. And, uh, and before I begin, I need to, oops, advance. So uh, here are my disclosures, uh, the funding agencies that have supported me through the years uh, as a postdoc and, and faculty. And uh, we have a number of patents associated with the technologies I'll be talking about today. Um, and some of those technologies are various forms of energy that can be consumed that can increase brain energy metabolism. So I'll be talking about that. Uh, consult for a number of, of uh, companies. And uh, I also, I know how hard it is to put on symposiums. I uh, am a co-host for the Metabolic Health Summit. And we also have a podcast that just launched the Metabolic Link podcast. Uh, so my lab, and also I try to instill in the people working under me, education outreach. And I think it's really important for, uh, for making the science, or for moving the science into human application. And that's been a big thrust of what we do in the lab. So here's a general outline of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I started my research uh, with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You may have heard of that. Uh, high levels of oxygen experienced by Navy divers are a limitation for their uh, operational procedures, including the Navy SEALs. So one consequence of breathing high levels of oxygen in, an, a, in a warfighter environment is seizures. So I started directing my research from uh, drugs in pharmacology-based research into more nutrition-based research because there's a diet that I discovered that I was not taught when I went through undergrad nutrition program called the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet is actually the standard of care for epilepsy or drug refractory epilepsy. So I'll be talking about how a dietary approach can change brain energy metabolism and also be neuroprotective. And uh, we've had some studies at the Bird Alzheimer's Institute uh, where I met my wife, and uh, we did some research there, and I'll talk about the ongoing studies that are that are happening. So, uh, but before I begin, I the thing that started me down this path was developing hyperbaric technologies, and and really using these technologies to understand uh, oxygen toxicity seizures which is a limitation of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but it's also a limitation for our Navy SEAL divers. So in our lab, we've, uh, we use a variety of different technologies, including uh, different forms of microscopy. Uh, we put biosensors on rodents and we look at their effects under extreme environments. And that could be the undersea environment, but also the space environment. Uh, 
So undersea is high pressure. And then if you're at altitude or you're in space, you could be exposed to lower levels of barometric pressure, lower levels of oxygen. So what we do is design technology and we house them inside these uh, environmental chambers or hyperbaric chambers or hypobaric chambers to understand physiologically uh, what's going on. So the basis for what I'll be talking about today was really um, experiments that I did through 2004 and maybe like 2008 for four or five years where we, we develop various technologies where we can look everything down to the cell or the mitochondria. The mitochondria is an organelle in the cell that generates energy to uh, brain slices. So for example, some of the studies we did uh, as a postdoctoral fellow was looking at the hippocampus. The hippocampus is involved in learning and memory. And what we can do in animal model systems is we take the brain out and we slice the brain like a piece of bread. And we keep that brain tissue alive uh, for the course of a day. And then we study the hippocampus, which is really the center for learning and memory. And we try to understand fundamentally how we can augment the brain activity to increase synaptic, to increase the, the firing of the neurons to help enhance something called long-term potentiation, which is the strengthening of synapses to form memories. Uh, the hippocampus is also a region that becomes hyperexcitable, for example, in temporal lobe epilepsy, and also is sort of what we think is associated with oxygen toxicity seizures. So we look at various signaling processes from the mitochondria to the cell to animal models, and we test various drugs and we test different dietary protocols and we test different supplements. And some of these things are actionable things that you can do that I'll be talking about later in my presentation. But we've been able to move the basic science research into human clinical trials. And I'll be talking a little bit about that. And some of the research that we did was with NASA's experimental uh, research operations or ex experimental extreme environment mission operations. They call it NEMO because NASA likes acronyms where astronauts train in an undersea environment. And I, I was a participant in uh, some of the training, NEMO 22, and my wife was on NEMO 23, where we trained with some of the astronauts. Some of them just came down uh, from the space station and were part of the training to conduct various protocols that they'll use in space and on the lunar surface and on Mars. So that was a great um, opportunity to do that. And during this process, I stayed in a state of nutritional ketosis and, and did a variety of different cognitive and functional tasks um, with the sort of basis that being in a altered metabolic state can provide metabolic resilience in these extreme environments. And I think it has direct applications uh, for managing neurodegenerative disorders, cognitive disorders, and that's sort of the foundation of the science that I'll be talking about today. So let me see if this comes off. So uh, one of the areas of research that really inspired me was a study that was done uh, at Harvard Medical School. And this was done by George Cahill. So I had the opportunity to talk with George Cahill uh, prior to his passing in 2012, I believe. And in this particular study prior to 1967, they thought the brain could only use glucose as an energy source and that we needed to eat carbohydrates and sugar to maintain brain energy metabolism. But in the context of fasting, this changes uh, considerably. So in this particular study, they fasted subjects for 40 days. So no food, <laughs> no, no energy, no calories for 40 days. So this type of experiment could not be replicated today because there's an ethical board review called the IRB and they would never approve any kind of study like this today. But they fasted subjects for 40 days and um, the interesting observation was that their ketone levels, which I'll be talking about, uh, started to elevate uh, after about seven to 10 days, the levels of ketones in the blood exceeded the levels of glucose. So the levels of glucose stayed relatively stable after it went down for about, you know, the first five to seven days, because there's very powerful 
uh, homeostatic mechanisms or regulatory mechanisms that we have to maintain our blood glucose. And that's uh, the physiology that we study in our lab. But the important point is that the brain has an incredible capacity for what I call metabolic flexibility. So in fasting state or when we go on a ketogenic diet, the ketone bodies that I'll be talking about, which are energy molecules, become the predominant fuel for the brain. And after, in, in a fed state, we're all gonna have lunch after the talk and it probably won't be ketogenic, but in a fed state, typically our brain uses glucose 100% of the time, only in the context of prolonged fasting. After about three to four days, then the metabolic shift happens where we liberate fat for energy. Fat does not cross the blood brain barrier. It gets converted to water soluble fat molecules that get chopped up and they get in the circulation and then they can get to our brain. And these are called ketone molecules. And after about a week of fasting, about 70% of brain energy metabolism is derived from these ketone molecules. So we think that the ketogenic diet or fasting is not very, uh, feasible to do, but that we could harness the energies of, of the ketone molecules and use them for a wide variety of different uh, applications. In an extension of this study that was published uh, that I found only in uh, a textbook, because I assume maybe this particular aspect of the study was not IRB approved, they injected insulin in subjects that were fasted, typically a level of insulin that would be fatal. So these subjects had not eaten any food and they infused 20 IUs of insulin uh, to the subjects, which caused severe hypoglycemia. So the level of glucose that you all have right now is about five to maybe 10 millimolar. Uh, typically in America, we use milligrams per deciliter. So about hundred milligrams per deciliter they injected insulin and dropped the level of glucose in the subjects down to about uh, 20 to 15 milligrams per deciliter of insulin. And if you're a diabetic and you're checking glucose levels, you know, typically you wanna get about 80 to 90 and that's a good glucose control. And when you get below 50, you start experiencing severe hypoglycemia. And then at about 30, you'll go unconscious. And then at 20, you'll have a seizure. So these subjects, what was interesting in these fasting subjects, they were asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. So it was a very dramatic demonstration that elevating ketones through fasting and then administering insulin, which uh, causes your muscle cells to take up glucose, but it limits glucose availability to the brain. Uh, in the context of fasting and administering insulin, the ketones provided brain resilience. So they became the alternative energy substrate for the brain. And then prior to you know, the mid 60s, we, we didn't think this was that ketones could do that. So in, the, uh, in my medical lectures, you know, I teach the pathophysiological hypoglycemia and typically these would produce, but all subjects lived in this study at Harvard and, uh, and they were asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. So this, uh, the work that was done by George Cahill and Richard Veach at the NIH and uh, uh, Theodore Van Italy, who's in his mid nineties now, all these guys were icons and they studied uh, ketones for some time and I was able to connect with them. And, uh, and they really instilled in me as a medical educator that ketosis was not something that was bad. Ketosis is only bad in the context of diabetic ketoacidosis. And that happens in the context of uh, type one diabetes where there's a deficiency of insulin. If our body cannot make insulin, then we lack the regulatory control to basically excrete ketones and to regulate the ketogenesis process. What I'll be talking about today is distinctly different than diabetic ketoacidosis. We, we're gonna call it nutritional ketosis. So in the context of nutritional ketosis, this could be achieved through carbohydrate restricting uh, ketogenic diet, which is a diet that's restricted in sugar and carbohydrates. It's moderate in protein, adequate protein, and uh, it's actually very high in fat. So this per, uh, produces a physiological state that changes our energy metabolism systemically, and it also changes our brain energy metabolism.
so the ketogenic diet is actually used uh, for drug resistant seizures in the pediatric population. And studies that were done at Johns Hopkins showed by, uh, by Dr. Freeman and then later uh, Dr. Eric Kossoff, who is a friend and colleague of mine. He runs the epilepsy clinic at Johns Hopkins. They demonstrated that about 60% of pediatric patients will respond to the ketogenic diet after all drugs fail or multiple drugs fail to control seizures, then you put those patients who have failed all drugs on a ketogenic diet, pediatric patients, and about 60% of their, them have seizure control. About 30% of these patients will have over 90% seizure control and about 10 to 15% are what we would call super responders, which means they have a complete absence of seizures. They're hundred percent seizure free and they can ultimately wean off of the diet and it does not cause rebound seizures. So this is evidence of a diet, not only changing brain energy metabolism, it changes the neuropharmacology of the brain, it changes uh, the neuroinflammation state of the brain, but it repairs the brain so you could get off of the diet and never have a seizure again. So a meta-analysis was done that this diet can also work in adults. It's a little bit less uh, efficacious uh, due to probably compliance problems and the pediatric population is just more responsive to it. Uh, Dr. Kossoff's book is uh, ketogenic diet for uh, ketogenic diet therapies. Uh, in the, the first version of the book that I read when I was a postdoc was really focused on epilepsy, but there has been an expanding application of the ketogenic diet beyond epilepsy. And that has really been sort of the focus of our lab. Um, in the, the late 2000s, I connected with a, a fellow in the UK, Mike Dancer, and Mike Dancer was an adult with epilepsy, and he was going to have brain surgery to remove part of his hippocampus, and then he was put on the diet, and it stopped seizures, so he's an adult advocate of the ketogenic diet, and uh, he's been a good friend and a um, good friend of mine who's you know, out in the field having to do this himself because there really wasn't the medical staff to manage him. There are different types of ketogenic diets. The classical ketogenic diet is very high in fat. Uh, there is a modified Atkins diet or modified ketogenic diet. Uh, there's a low glycemic index diet. Uh, and let me see. So the ketogenic diet has many different mechanisms. And the big focus of our lab is trying to understand mechanistically how the ketogenic diet is working. And we've developed various agents that can increase the levels of ketones. The ketone bodies have uh, effects not only as an energy molecule, but they're, they're more like a hormone signaling molecule. There's a ketone receptor. They function to uh, influence gene expression. We call this epigenetic regulation. They, uh, they impact various inflammatory processes called the inflammasome, which can kick off the elevation of other inflammatory molecules, they can suppress that. So we're studying a broad array of signaling effects of these things that our body can make. Our body can make ketones endogenously, and then we have ways to elevate levels of ketones through exogenous administration. And the ketones can function more like a drug, these metabolites can. So, the ketogenic diet took a really big increase in, in research and exposure by Jim Abrams. And I connected with him about 10 years ago. I, I got called to do a TEDx talk, like when I was uh, younger and on the keto, and I wanted to do it on the ketogenic diet. So I reached out to Jim Abrams, who is friends with Meryl Streep and Meryl Streep did a movie on the ketogenic diet. It's called First Do No Harm. And I think it's still available like on YouTube. So uh, Meryl Streep's movie was about Jim's son, Charlie. So I connected with the Charlie Foundation early on and talked quite a lot with Jim. And the, uh, the, the conference that we host, the Metabolic Health Summit, we bring Jim and the Charlie Foundation and a lot of the proceeds go to support that foundation. But Jim was very angry that the ketogenic diet was not offered to his son because his son was put on about a half dozen different medications and they have very significant developmental consequences. And he went to Johns Hopkins and finally got his son on a ketogenic diet and it completely stopped all the seizures and he was able to get off all the drugs. So Jim went on Dateline NBC in uh, 1994 and I was a nutrition student at the time. I remember seeing it uh, 
But all I remember about the ketogenic diet was that it was this fad diet and, you know, only under extreme circumstances would you do it for pediatric epilepsy. But Jim went on Dateline NBC, got a lot of exposure for the ketogenic diet. This is prior to me having a research interest in the diet, but that really sparked uh, the academic community and the clinical community to do research on this topic. So here's a little thing I put together about the therapeutic applications of the ketogenic diet. So, you know, weight loss, everybody's heard of the Atkins diet, uh, type two diabetes, Verda Health is doing a lot of work on the type two diabetes front and their, their whole motto is to deprescribe. <laughs> so they can get pretty much 85 to 90% of, of type two diabetics off medication with a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And then they have a medical staff and an app that, that they work with. We study a lot of diseases where the standard of care is the ketogenic diet. So that would be glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome. And there's a, a wide range of, I just came from a disease on glycogen storage disease uh, type two in Orlando. I'm just coming from there. So there's a lot of rare diseases where the ketogenic diet is the standard of care. So we're working hard to develop various protocols that people can follow. Not everybody can follow this diet. And I think, especially for this population, we wanna develop uh, dietary protocols and also supplements that can mimic the therapeutic effects of the diet. But there's a lot of neurological applications, uh, including Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. And uh, we study something called Angelman syndrome, a wide variety of emerging applications. And some of my colleagues uh, who do basic science research, John Newman, for example, have studied the cyclic ketogenic diet in mice, and they're moving that to human studies where uh, you can follow a diet for a week, <laughs> a ketogenic diet, go back to your normal diet, follow the diet again for a week. This is what they did in mice and show that it, had, uh, it could help the mice avoid obesity. As mice, mice age, they tend to get overweight and obese. Uh, it can also reduce midlife mortality, what we call our health span. And a cyclic ketogenic diet can prevent uh, a modest uh, prevention of, uh, of memory and also just general enhancement of health span over time. So this is following the diet every other week. So this was one strategy that is often discussed. You can imagine following a ketogenic diet during the week and taking the weekends off, for example. Uh, another study was done by uh, Megan Roberts, uh, who did a, a continuous ketogenic diet. And this was also a longevity study where they looked at how a ketogenic diet uh, extend longevity in mice. This was continuous. It enhanced motor function, memory, and also had like what we call a muscle sparing or anti-catabolic effect. And I'm going to come back to that later because the ketone bodies that are elevated Part of their function, probably from an evolutionary perspective, is to preserve muscle in the context of fasting. So if we did not make ketone bodies when we were fasting, we would break down muscle tissue to get glucose. We call this gluconeogenic amino acids. And because our fat can be broken down and used by muscle, and then the fat can be converted to ketones. That's how we elevate ketones naturally through the breakdown of fat. And then the ketones can cross the blood brain barrier and energize our brain. If our brain does not get ketones for energy, it would need glucose and it would need to break down a lot of tissue. So there's a lot of uh, potential, you know, physiological effects beyond just brain energy. Another interesting aspect of a ketogenic diet, which is a whole nother program we have in the lab, we work with Moffitt Cancer Center and a number of my PhD students and postdocs work at Moffitt and run studies on the ketogenic diet as an adjuvant for standard of care, uh, particularly brain cancer, which you can also have seizures with that. But the ketogenic diet in, in the context of this study also suppressed spontaneous tumor formations, you know, in, in the mice. And the mice that we work, all ex experimentally, mice typically die of organ failure or cancer. So mice, they don't really get like uh, cardiovascular disease or, or atherosclerosis or anything like that. They typically die of, of uh, organ failure or more commonly from different types of cancers. So the mice are very responsive to this. Uh, research on mice, on cancer is not, it's very informative, but not always very predictive. So I'm very cautious when I present uh, 
the, the studies on cancer because some of the effects are very dramatic. Uh, we can mechanistically understand how the diet works, but it do doesn't always translate to humans. But there are about 40 or 50 uh, clinical trials right now using the ketogenic diet for cancer. And that's another topic. But there are what we focus on are the emerging applications of different types of ketogenic diets and different ways to elevate ketones in the blood, in the body that can circumvent the diet. So it's very difficult to follow carbohydrate restricted diet long term. You know, even for epilepsy, it needs to be highly calculated. And we've all heard of the Atkins diet, and there are products you know you can buy in the supermarket at Publix. There's a whole keto section. You've probably seen it. Most of those foods are really not ketogenic. They may be low low carb, but they're sort of beyond the scope of the ketogenic diet that I'm talking about, which is a very precise macronutrient ratio of fats to proteins to carbohydrates. And that ratio needs to be maintained to elevate and sustain ketones. So the ketogenic diet is the only diet that I know of that is defined by an objective biomarker. And that's the elevation of urine ketones, breath ketones, or, or blood ketones. Uh, so this can, there's commercially available technologies that we can use to measure these. So, and that's actually shown uh, to the right there. So we can elevate ketones with different types of ketogenic diets. And I'll be talking about a different type of fat from coconut oil. So coconut oil has something called medium chain triglycerides. And when we consume this uh, type of fat, it is converted to ketones. So we can put ourselves in a state of ketosis without necessarily having to restrict sugar or carbohydrates. Uh, but all, I think that there's many benefits to doing that for blood glucose regulation. And then in addition to the ketogenic fats, there are exogenous ketone molecules that are being developed. Uh, we are using them experimentally. And, oops, and there are a wide variety of signaling effects associated with ketones. And that are highlighted here. I'm not going through all the signaling effects of ketones, but ketones can not only increase brain energy, it can decrease neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation could be a consequence of having inflammation in your body. For example, you can get blood work and get C-reactive protein or high sensitivity C-reactive protein elevated. And the elevation of this inflammatory marker will drive amyloid and tau accumulation, right? So we sort of believe that the amyloidosis or the, the accumulation of amyloid and tau that defines Alzheimer's disease, we feel, and you know, you could live your whole life and have tons of amyloid and never get Alzheimer's disease or never have dementia. So, I mean, we know this and, but out, you know, Amyloid and tau are part of Alzheimer's disease, but not the, there's a debate as to whether it's causative. So we think that there's a lot of heterogeneity with Alzheimer's disease. I think we can accept that. But uh, we also think that impaired glucose metabolism, neuroinflammation, and an impairment of the, the blood brain barrier, these things will precede the accumulation of amyloid. So amyloid, then the accumulation of amyloid would be a downstream epiphenomenon, if you will, of a decrease in brain energy metabolism of neuroinflammation. And this inflammation can start in the body. Systemic inflammation will lead to neuroinflammation. If we have inflammation uh, in our blood, that inflammation is affecting the blood brain barrier. It's making it permeable to other things that shouldn't be there. And that triggers inflammation in the brain. This could trigger headaches. This could trigger brain fog. An example of this is COVID, for example, um, various viruses, herpes simplex virus, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, all these things can impair our, our physiology, impair our metabolism and cause inflammation, which can trigger neuroinflammation. Um, and for example, even th something like Lyme's disease, different types of infections, syphilis, for example, could, uh, could trigger Alzheimer's disease or, or dementia. So it's important to acknowledge that, you know, different uh, infections could, could be a root cause of this too. But I think the etiology is likely pretty, pretty heterogeneous.
we've done studies okay, where we administer ketones in the form of ketone salts or ketone esters to animals. And this has a remarkable neuroprotective anti-seizure effect. So if you remember, you know, the, the thing that put me on this path was looking at seizures. The military wanted to develop agents that could be administered orally that could elevate ketones within a high level, a pharmacological level. And then that could rapidly, for example, be uh, implemented in a Navy SEAL that was going into a mission. When you start a ketogenic diet, it could take up to a week or more to elevate your ketones into therapeutic levels, right? So if you, the agents that we work with in our lab, you could administer them orally, and then you check your blood within 30 minutes, and it looks like you fasted for 10 days. So you can get the elevation that high. And, and when you elevate ketones into that five millimolar range, the brain can use these ketones without any uh, adaptation. So we have the transport processes there. So our brain is basically you know, functioning off ketones immediately after administering these agents. And so we've developed the rationale for using these and we're, we're moving them into different clinical trials uh, for, for humans and for specifically for seizure disorders, but there's also studies with Alzheimer's. So we did a number of animal studies. I won't go into all the mechanisms, but we think there's applications for a wide range of genetic disorders, neurodegenerative disorders, and also traumatic brain injury. So traumatic brain injury is almost like Alzheimer's disease in real time. So when you have traumatic brain injury, you have, uh, if you do a scan of the brain, it shows very prominently impaired glucose metabolism. And there's a lot of metabolic pathways that are shut down that mimic uh, Alzheimer's disease. For example, the glucose transporters and different enzymes like pyruvate, the hydrogenase complex. You don't have to know all that stuff, but there's, there's some similarities there. Oops, sorry. Uh, so for example, uh, I'm going to give just a, not get to get too sciencey here, but just a brief overview of ketone induced bioenergetics. So in the context of uh, brain injury or different neuropathologies, there's an impaired transporter getting glucose across the blood brain barrier. Uh, we have glucose in circulation in our blood, but it needs to get into our brain. And one gate gating mechanism is called the blood brain barrier. And there is a particular transporter there called, called the glucose transporter type one or glut one. So we have mice in our lab that have a deficiency in glut one. And I've been at speaking at different conferences on glut one therapy where the kids need to be in a state of ketosis or else they're completely catatonic. They, once their ketones get elevated, they wake up and it's like, you know, their, their brain's running on energy. And a hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease is glucose hypometabolism, right? So we know this, let's see. So uh, for example, if you do something called a fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan or a, a scan where you radio label sugar, the glucose molecule, and you do these scans on patients that have mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, you see, you see a significant decrease in glucose metabolism. <laughs> now, we don't really understand why this occurs. It could be a vascular issue. It could be a deficiency of the GLUT3 transporter of different enzyme systems that metabolize glucose, but a hallmark characteristic, it's not always used because it's a little bit more pricey to do these scans, but a hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's is impaired glucose metabolism. So it's also quite common feature in depression. People who have depression have uh, an impaired uh, glucose hypometabolism. So I talked to you about when you elevate ketones, they can freely cross the blood brain barrier. So the state of ketosis could be a means to restore brain energy metabolism uh, by filling the gap, by restoring and offsetting uh, you know, glucose metabolism. There's much more to the story because when you elevate ketones, it changes the neuropharmacology of the brain. So it decreases something called glutamate, it elevates GABA, it influences dopamine signaling, serotonin signaling, uh, it influences neuroinflammation in a very profound way. 
So there's multiple things happening uh, by this single agent. We call it pleiotropic. And, and we think that these things, it's not one mechanism, but many mechanisms in synergy that actually enhance brain function. So uh, Stephen Kunane, a friend of ours, uh, has done a variety of studies on subjects and published a lot of data using what's called a dual uh, PET scan. So you could do imaging of the brain to show glucose metabolism, but you could also do imaging of the brain to show ketone metabolism. And what's known is that as we age, we have a progressive decline in the brain's ability to use glucose as an energy source. As we age, there's not a decrease in the brain's ability to use ketones over time. So your brain uh, at, at the age of 80 can use ketones at about the same rate that it could when it was 40, so over time. And this has profound implications for the therapeutic use of ketosis over time. So we did a number of studies to show this. Uh, early on, what really got me interested in this topic, uh, it was about 2008, where in the St. Pete Times, I saw that there was a doctor who was using coconut oil and maybe she was a speaker here, Dr. Mary Newport. She ran the neonatal intensive care unit in St. Pete, but her husband got Alzheimer's disease. He was being treated at the Bird Alzheimer's Center at the Morsani College of Medicine at the USF campus. And I was connected with Dave Morgan, who is the director of the Alzheimer's Center there. And he reached out to me and said he wanted to talk to me. So uh, Mary and her husband came to the Bird and I observed and going and spending time with her and watching her husband consume uh, MCT oil, which is derived from coconut oil, his tremor stopped, he became animated. And I thought that this was an interesting direction to go into research. So uh, we wrote a grant to the Alzheimer's Association and it was funded and it became a PhD project of, of mine uh, or my students. And actually the book, Mary's book is uh, clearly keto. And um, I wrote the foreword to it and my PhD student um, who's now moved on and working other places, Melanie Brownlow, I helped, helped to write the, that, uh, that foreword. But an interesting observation that Mary made was that, uh, and her husband improved significantly on the mini mental state exam and also the clock test. And it was documented at Bird Alzheimer's Center. So the center director wanted to do some, some research on this. Um, so we looked at the mice. So there are problems with mice that have Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so the amyloid pathology in mice is quite different than in humans. And the mice that we looked at, they already had fairly advanced Alzheimer's symptoms. There, it was about week uh, six or eight where we intervened with a ketogenic diet and we saw dramatic improvements in motor function. We put the mice on something called a rotor rod and they just ran 30% longer. <laughs> and they were stronger and many of the blood markers looked to be better, but it did, not, it did not stop the amyloid pathology from happening. So we did uh, the triple transgenic, double transgenic, we did different animal models, but we started a bit late, but our colleagues at uh, the NIH, Dr. Richard Veach, uh, who was really my mentor getting into this, he was the student of Hans Krebs. If you guys remember the Krebs cycle. So he, he was really old guy, recently passed away a few years ago, but he really advanced the science of ketones. I did a lot of work uh, at Oxford and then at NIH and steered me onto this path. So he did research and that's Dr. Veach in the picture here. Oops, sorry. And uh, so in the mice that they did the intervention, they used a ketone ester and they started at just after weaning in mice, that's about three or four weeks. And then in, in the context of ketone administration, if you start early enough, that could attenuate significantly, reduce the accumulation of amyloid and tau. So, uh, you know, that, that was significant and it also changed a lot of different metabolic markers. So what was interesting with Mary's observation, Dr. Newport's observation in, uh, in 2008, was that she was giving her husband coconut oil, which is a source of medium chain triglycerides and anybody can get coconut oil. And she started digging into why was this coconut oil working for my husband? And her research found a patent. Uh, it wasn't published at the time, but the patent was a ketogenic molecule called AC1202. 
So she was able to pull the patent and look at the ingredient in AC-1202, and it was called uh, caprylic triglyceride. And that's just the fancy chemical name for something called medium chain triglycerides or MCT. And you could go to Walgreens, you could go to CVS, you can go to Publix, and they have a whole MCT section <laughs> there. So you could go and buy this oil and take it. And what was super remarkable about the study that was published with AC-1202 is that it reversed cognitive impairment. So they did the mini, mini mental state exam um, on people who had mild cognitive impairment and it improved their cognitive scores in a number of different areas. The people who were APOE4 positive who had who were homozygous had less of a robust response, at least in that study that was published in 2008. But then they went on and it was more of like a sample size thing with a greater sample size um, the general consensus is that people who have ApoE4, the gene for Alzheimer's, could also benefit from this. So, uh, so, okay, I think this was the next, sorry about that. So this, there's a number of human studies that have resulted from this early observation, and I would actually credit Dr. Mary Newport for doing the educational outreach. She went to the Alzheimer's Association, uh, we got a grant through the Alzheimer's Association at, at USF and did some work uh, and inspired many of the investigators to actually study this because this was not a drug. There's not pharmaceutical companies stepping in. Now there's a couple companies that are what we call medical food companies that are sort of advancing the development of these um, it's kind of hard to call them, you know, supplements or drugs. They're trying to make these foods druggable by changing the molecules in some way. Uh, but still, MCT that you buy at the store is just as effective, I think, as some of these things that are being developed. Uh, so there was a number of studies that were done, and this is a recent review article entitled, I believe this is also open access. So if you just Google the therapeutic role of the ketogenic diet and neurological disorders, a lot of that review talks about epilepsy, but it also talks about migraines and Parkinson's disease but it highlights the, the studies that have been done specifically in this, this content on MCT oil. And actually there's, in every case, there's remarkable effects. Uh, they're not robust, but you have, you know, the data on these monoclonal antibodies that are targeting tau and tar or targeting amyloid beta are not robust. We're talking about the same level of efficacy using something that you could go to the store and buy and treating symptomatically. So we're not talking that it's targeting specifically amyloid or tau, but when you consume this fuel, it's actually increasing the availability of energy to the brain. So this is something actionable that you can do. There's, you know, peer reviewed science, not only on PubMed, but also clinicaltrials.gov. There's about 14 clinical trials looking at this. And it doesn't really get the exposure that it deserves, but it's highlighted in the book, Clearly Keto by Dr. Mary Newport. So, you know, the Department of Defense is very keen on what works. <laughs> so, and they are convinced that ketones have remarkable neuroprotective effects. And most of the research on ketones is for athletic performance and creating like the super soldier, increasing endurance and things like that in extreme environments. My, uh, my research specifically is actually looking at oxygen toxicity. So we've, we've moved the animal model studies into human subject studies that are being done at Duke University in uh, collaboration with the University of South Florida, where I'm from, where we're using a ketogenic diet to reduce oxygen toxicity. In working divers, the next phase we'll use uh, the Navy SEALs. So we're using basically surrogates for the SEALs, guys that have good athletic condition, they're willing to do the diet. Uh, and we, we put them on a ketogenic diet for just three days and we also administer a ketone supplement. And this lowers blood glucose and elevates ketones into that therapeutic range. And we do, uh, we do blood gases, we do EEG, uh, and we do pulmonary function tests. And we also have them, this is a picture of a guy inside a hyperbaric chamber where we're measuring brain activity. 
we're doing pulmonary function tests and he's doing a simulator. So he's flying, <laughs> I think, all while he's pressurized almost three atmospheres of oxygen. And we basically push him to having a seizure. Don't ask me how we got IRB approval, but they push, <laughs> they push the subject in the hyperbaric chamber until we start to see EEG activity, seizure activity. And we decompress right after we see EEG activity because that typically the EEG activity will show before they actually have a seizure. In a few cases, they've had a seizure, but uh, th this, these seizures are completely reversible. So uh, what we have demonstrated is that similar to the animal studies is that we can delay the latency to seizure. So we could increase not only the, the safety, but the operational performance of subjects that are in these extreme environments. And I think it has, uh, I think it has implications for everybody's in an extreme environment. And as we age, our brain's ability to use glucose goes down. Uh, we're under stress. Stress can cause neuroinflammation. Uh, environmental toxins can cause neuroinflammation, our diets, many different factors can alter brain energy, metabolism, and neuroinflammation uh, in a way that could be mitigated or attenuated by ketones. So there are side effects to a ketogenic diet, and it's important to understand this, that uh, contraindications include pancreatitis, liver failure, uh, there are different enzymes associated with the transport of fatty acids, fatty acid oxidation disorders, vitamins or electrolyte deficiencies. It's very important to measure this. When we do blood work on people on a ketogenic diet, we also often see a carnitine deficiency. So carnitine is something that your body uses to transport fat into the mitochondria and your body is burning so much fat that it's depleting some of the molecules that are associated with that. Uh, in bones, bone metabolism in kids, especially the earlier studies with the protein restriction, there's a, a little bit of a growth impairment, but now we know a little bit more about the importance of protein. So early ketogenic diets were very low in protein, like 8% protein. And it's my opinion that they should be about 15 to 20% protein, uh, cause you don't want protein, uh, deficiencies, especially in a growing kid. Lipid abnormalities too, that has been the big pushback, uh, LDL and ApoB, something called ApoB. When these get elevated in the context of everything else improving, typically when you go on a low carbohydrate diet or ketogenic diet, most of the cardio metabolic biomarkers that are most important, blood pressure, triglycerides, hemoglobin A1C, your glucose levels, all these things improve, uh, but sometimes LDL, and a marker for this a form of cholesterol, ApoB, which is a more indicative of um, a, a more a better indicator of the bad cholesterol, shall we say, uh, can go up. And and we don't know what that means in the context of a high fat ketogenic diet. So that that's the big field of research right now is understanding that not everybody's LDL and ApoB will go up, but a percentage do. So we're figuring out how to deal with that. And that could be simply treated with a low dose of a statin, but then they have problems too. So that needs to be, you got to proceed cautiously. And also women tend to respond a little bit different to the ketogenic diet, especially younger women. We know this from the epilepsy world is that there's five times more li likely to be amenorrheic to you to lose your period or to stop menstruating in particular if the protein is low or the calories are too restricted that can cause amenorrhea and a reduction if you're a nursing mother uh, lactation can be reduced and there's some debate as to whether it can alter your thyroid but i believe that some of the literature on females on ketogenic diet uh, their hormonal effects tend to be in the context of calorie restriction or in populations that are over-exercising. So if you go on a ketogenic diet to lose weight and you calorie restrict too much and you over-exercise, then that could result in lower thyroid and changes in your menstrual cycle. So these are things that are sort of hotly debated and contested. <laughs> Uh, some people think there is, but if we just go to the epilepsy literature that women do not always adapt as well as men do to a ketogenic diet or to things like intermittent fasting. So there are different, when we talk about the ketogenic diet, it's important to acknowledge that there are many different types of ketogenic diets 
even that are used clinically. So the restrictive classical ketogenic diet versus the modified Atkins diet, also called the modified ketogenic diet. What we're really interested in is using a more liberal version of a ketogenic diet that anybody can follow. Even you could go to any restaurant and basically follow a more liberal modified ketogenic diet by just asking for vegetables and fish or chicken and then adding you know, some extra butter or olive oil on the side you would be hitting the food ratios, what we call the macronutrient ratios that would be similar to a modified ketogenic diet. And that could be used for anything, you know, type two diabetes or weight loss, or even, you know, preventing or potentially treating Alzheimer's disease, which is being studied now. But we're really interested in ways that we can further augment the therapeutic efficacy of the ketogenic diet with supplementation. And to do this, we look at various biomarkers, including blood glucose and ketone levels. And we know that with, um, with a modified ketogenic diet, we achieve just a low level of ketosis and it doesn't really change. It brings glucose down a little bit, but if we supplement with ketones or MCT oil, which you can get at pretty much any store, we can further lower blood glucose and we can elevate ketones to arrange that the level of glucose and ketones are a similar level in the blood. So this gives your brain two different fuels to draw from, and, and it will prevent your brain from having an energetic deficiency, which could cause brain fog, which can you know, decrease your cognitive function. So it's all about optimizing that fuel flow to the brain. So there's different ways to do that with the diet, but also supplementing the diet with ketogenic agents like MCT oil or ketone salt supplementation, which uh, is an area that we study. And what's really interesting about studying this dietary intervention is that there's commercially available technology. Some of it is relatively very cheap that you can measure your own ketone levels and then adjust the diet and supplement uh, to correlate, to optimize the level of ketosis to where you feel good. So some people think that the optimal level is about one to two millimolar in the blood. And these are just some pictures of measurements that we do in the lab. There's a breath meter called uh, Biosense. I think it's made by Readout Health. Abbott Labs makes the Precision Extra. You can get this at any CVS, Walgreens, Amazon. Uh, there's a company called Keto Mojo. They make a device that's pretty good. Uh, and then there's technology that's emerging now, and I'm wearing something on the back of my arm called the continuous glucose monitor or a CGM. So CGM devices are typically used for diabetics, type one diabetics and type two diabetics. There are monitors that are being developed, uh, or just simply wearing a continuous glucose monitor will give you great insight into your metabolism. So glucose is probably the most important metabolic biomarker that you have in your body and being able to see real time changes in response to what you're eating can help be a behavioral tool to modify not only what you're eating, but the amount of food that you're eating too. And if you can optimize your glucose and reduce the spikes and the postprandial dips in glucose, you can optimize brain function. So this is a whole nother area of research that we do using continuous glucose monitoring to optimize metabolism and behavior and cognitive function. But there are new devices being made that will measure glucose, they measure ketones, they measure lactate. So you put a device on the back, I have mine on the back of my arm here, and you can look at your smartphone and it's like having a dashboard. We call this metabolomics. So it can look at dozens of different metabolites in real time. You could drink a ketone or eat a meal and then see in real time what's happening to your physiology. So this will be very important technology for caregivers to have to know, to understand that the nutritional status and the metabolism of their patient is optimized. And I think it has tremendous potential. And we're working on it from the side of like military and space applications the DOD invests a lot in this, but my, I'm more motivated to move this to the general population because I think it has tremendous applications uh, for, for many, different, um, many different scenarios for 
neurological diseases, for metabolic diseases, for weight management, for example. So here's a, just a quick overview of the studies that, that we're doing. And I'm not gonna go through all of them because I pretty much you know, explained them, uh, but we are looking at you know, cancer two, oxygen toxicity. Uh, we're working with the Alzheimer's Association or the Bird Alzheimer's Center on different projects related to the gut microbiome and how that changes and various uh, microbes that could be important for uh, the efficacy of the ketogenic diet. So some studies in mice showed that there's changes in the gut microbiome that contribute to the therapeutic effects of the ketogenic diet and that needs to be studied. So a list of references here and, oh, okay. So I have to thank the lab because they're the ones doing the work right now. I have the honor here to speak to you today about what we're doing, but it's really my team of medical students, undergraduates, postdocs, research associates that are doing the, doing the work in the field. Uh, I've also divided my time to working in the metabolic lab, but also the hyperbaric biomedical research lab, which is uh, more of a DOD funded site uh, where we do hyperbaric research and we vet out these various nutritional protocols to see what's most neuroprotective. And I uh, got to thank my wife because my wife is also a neuroscience researcher. I met her at the Bird Alzheimer's Center. She's there with our cows in the bottom figure. And we have a collaborator in Budapest, Hungary, that is very prolific with looking mechanistically at some of the, the ketone signaling pathways. And I think there are ways, as we advance the science, to package ketones in a pill, if you will, to make the diet more efficacious. And in some situations, there are people that are unwilling and unable to do the ketogenic diet. In many cases, we think that a supplement or various medical foods can be developed that could offer the same advantages that we've seen with the ketogenic diet. So thank you for your attention today and glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. D'Agostino. Um, we also have some caregivers who are attending um, on Zoom, and I have a question from one of the caregivers. Uh, can we find the multi-metabolic monitor in the public stores like Walgreens, the ones that have a sensor on the arm and you can review on your smartphone, much like going in and taking your blood pressure? Uh, these devices are primarily used in the world of diabetes. And right now I'm the principal investigator on a project uh, using Dexcom device. We have 10,000 subjects right now. So I have data coming in to me from 10,000 non-diabetic subjects. And that's, we don't know what normal glucose is. We, all the data that we've collected uh, on with continuous glucose monitors have been done on diabetes population. So for these reasons, and also, you know, various reasons outside of my realm that CGMs are prescription only, you can acquire a continuous glucose monitor through various companies like Levels Health, uh, and then they go through a third party called TruePill, and then they will give you access to it and then the technology that they're selling is not necessarily the, the CGM device, but the app that gives you actionable things based upon the data going into that app. And that app may also synchronize with a Fitbit, with like an aura ring, with a, a bio strap. Uh, there's EEG things that it can sync, sync with it. So, so I'm not answering your question, but I, I think that continuous glucose monitors, you can go to Canada and get one, you can go to anywhere else, but in the United States, for some reason, they're still prescription, unless you go through a company, like there's a couple companies, uh, Super Sapiens, but they target athletes, Levels Health is more like the general population. And then you sign up with them and then you do a questionnaire online and then you can get access uh, to the CGM device. Thank you. That way. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, is there a recommended dose of MCT oil daily or multiple times a day? Yeah, MC, you got to proceed cautiously with MCT oil. Uh, I, uh, I talked about it very, uh, I talked about it a lot quite like years ago, and I was on the Tim Ferriss podcast a couple of times and, and he used it and had like 
I, I remember him texting me and was like, you didn't warn me about the effects of <laughs> MCT oil because it can cause gastrointestinal upset and it's a great laxative. So with MCT oil, you want to start with one teaspoon and then work your way up uh, proportionally. And also if you use the MCT oil and incorporate it into food, uh, it actually has no taste. So you could, what I do is I mix half MCT oil, half extra virgin olive oil, and I'll make salad dressing out of it. So that's a way to get it. You can cook with it. You can, it has a very high flash point. Um, so you can titrate it in gradually. I think I got up to like 150 grams of, of MCT oil a day, and I was able to keep my ketones really high just with that amount of MCT oil. It's pretty cheap. You can get it on Amazon for like, you know, 12, 15 bucks a liter. Uh, and that's a lot of calories for a liter. So um, it's a source of energy. So yeah, start, uh, I, would, I would just say, start with the lowest dose and work up to assess your tolerability. And the more MCT oil you consume, the higher you can get your ketones. And also MCT oil crosses the blood brain barrier. Fat does not cross the blood brain barrier. The fat we have in our body and the fat we consume, that's long chain fatty acids, but short chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids actually have the ability to cross the blood brain barrier so that MCT oil can actually be used by your brain cells for energy. So this is kind of like new data that's come out, you know, since I've been researching. Um, cooking with the MCT is okay. When you say high flash point, does that mean the temperature will not ruin the effectiveness? Yeah, it doesn't. So MCT oil is saturated, which it's plant-based and saturated and it's probably not atherogenic. So that's one thing. Uh, it doesn't, it cooks well in that it will not catch on fire. So it doesn't have a high flash point, but it doesn't oxidize too. Uh, but it, it doesn't really have any taste. So some people like to cook with oils, like we have uh, avocado oil or macadamia nut oil is, is really tasty, uh, but it can be incorporated. I don't cook with it that often, but I mean, you can cook with it. You can bake with it. So you can switch out different types of oils like canola oil and use MCT oil. You just have to be careful and adjust the dosage to assess your, some people can tolerate lots of it and some people can't even tolerate one or two teaspoons. So there's a lot of individual variability with MCT, but there's good science behind it. There, you know, as you saw lots of clinical trials uh, that are already published and, and it's something that is readily accessible to you. And something that we also study, I don't talk about it too much because we have patents on it, are the ketone molecules beta hydroxybutyrate can be made into salts. We call these ketone salts. The ketones are actually bound to sodium, potassium, magnesium. So they bind to these electrolytes. So when you drink it, it liberates the ketones and also the electrolytes. And uh, if you mix the ketone salts with the MCT, that would be a way to get the highest ketones possible. And there's a lot of benefits uh, for that combination of exogenous ketones, which are also sold uh, you know, at, at different stores with MCT, that combination is probably the best combination. And many of these things taste good too. So as opposed to ketone esters, we've done a lot of research with, they do not taste good. They're more like medical applications or military applications. They taste really like drinking gasoline. So still okay. no, no company has been able to mask them. So. Okay. I have another question. Um, doesn't high fat affect the liver? And if there's no gallbladder, how is fat broken down? And how does the ketogenic diet affect the liver? Yeah, very good question. These are like these are like the best questions I've ever, even the past speakers <laughs> and Jason. I mean, these are like up oh, is much better than the scientific conferences I attend, <laughs> other conferences. But uh, that very good question. So when we consume fat, typically the gallbladder has to you know contracts, and then you know the uh, the pancreas also will secrete enzymes called lipase enzymes that can help digest the fat. Uh, so this is really important for long chain fatty acids with MCT oil, not, uh, not so much, but yeah, with a ketogenic diet that's high in fat, I've talked with many different people and, and also talked with many different uh, dietitians who have worked with hundreds of people who have no gallbladder and that can follow a low carb diet or ketogenic diet ketogenic diet can be hard. So typically what you do with these patients is start them on a high protein, moderate fat, low carb diet. 
So, and then you ease into and adjust the fat accordingly based upon their tolerance. So start low carbohydrate, but it's high protein, moderate fat. And we want to stick with healthy fats. Monounsaturated fats are probably the, the best fats and, and low carbohydrates. And when I say low carbohydrates, I'm talking, when I think carbohydrates on a ketogenic, I think fiber. So I think fat, protein, and fiber. So greafy, uh, leafy green vegetables, maybe uh, non-sugary fruits like uh, blueberries or raspberries, strawberries, um, but avoid things like bananas and mangoes. We have a lot of mango trees, so it's hard to avoid that. But, uh, <laughs> but you, know, you wanna stay away from, it's all about the macronutrients. And if you keep under 50 grams of carbohydrates per day, yes, thank you. and of those 50 grams of carbohydrates, about a third of the, if you look on the label or the food, uh, uh, if you look online, for example, of an avocado, you know, it has carbohydrates, but most of it's fiber or even like an apple or blueberries will be a high percentage of fiber. Oh, this is a, this is a good question. Many dementia patients crave sweets in excess. Will a ketone based diet or MCT supplement decrease or prevent these cravings? Yeah, that's a real, another really good question. And this is actually covered in Dr. Mary Newport's book. She talked about her husband just sitting at the sink and eating like, like, like seven or 10 oranges at a time. And then this overwhelming, insatiable, hyper palatability of sugar. And that's probably because of this term, we're using it for the past decade or more, type three diabetes. So type three diabetes is insulin resistance in the brain. So insulin's a physiological hormone that uh, allows the cells to use glucose as an energy source. So insulin can cross the blood brain barrier and actually has uh, effects on the brain. And one form of, I mean, there's like type four diabetes now, but type three diabetes is actually thought to be insulin resistance in the brain. And that probably contributes to this gluco glucose hypometabolism that is a hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease that we can see with the FDG PET scan I was showing. And when the brain is starved of glucose, that's actually triggering and signaling to the body that you need to crave carbohydrates to bring glucose back up. I mean, this happens also in type two diabetics that are insulin resistant and they can eat carbohydrates, but it's sort of, they have an insatiable feel. So if you elevate ketones, that's increasing the energy, uh, increasing brain energy metabolism. And if you increase brain energy metabolism, that will attenuate the de desire uh, for, for sugar. And I also have to say, like, when you go on a ketogenic diet, it's, it's hypo palatable, because it doesn't really taste good. So we say it's hypo palatable, but it's also hyper satiating. So the fat and protein have a satiating effect. And then when you elevate ketones, it, it changes your brain energy metabolism in a way that makes you crave sugar less just by elevating the ketones. But then the fat and the protein have a satiating effect. I'm an advocate of keeping fiber kind of high in a ketogenic diet and the fiber has a filling effect. So you have the satiating effect of fiber, fat and protein all can attenuate that glucose craving. And then when the ketones are elevated too, that changes brain circuitry in a way that attenuates the, the sugar cravings. Great question. Uh, I have a comment on the Zoom. He started his wife on MCT oil about three years ago, and it seemed to have helped. It started off slow, and they added as they went along. Um, another question on Zoom. Would you say the ratio of fat, carbs, and fiber are different for women or men on a keto diet? What... We've come to know and appreciate more with working with animal models with female animals, is that uh, if you put them on a ketogenic diet, their glucose levels drop more than the males. So I think males maybe have a more robust uh, way uh, to, to maintain glucose. We call that gluconeogenesis. Whereas when, and I've seen this in some of, sometimes in the early days, we'd have female students that would try to fast. And some of them were literally fainting in the lab or just, they were having side effects. And then I've never seen it in males, maybe because they're too macho to admit it or something. But, uh, but I think female physiology is much more reactive to uh, 
impaired glucose availability. And that could be through fasting or carbohydrate restricting. And, and when the, when females become, you know, even mild states of hypoglycemia can cause a reactive effect. And that could be an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. It could be, you know, changes in hormones that I have not seen sort of in, in males. So, uh, I think females, we did a, we did a, a clinical trial that we just finished now. And to make it more feasible, we reduced carbohydrates over six weeks. And that seemed to work for all the females. You gradually start from, you start at a hundred grams a day, which is pretty low carb. And then you work them down to 50 to 25 grams a day. And, and that seemed to work for all the females. Whereas just going right to 25 grams of carbs a day probably would not work historically. It's very difficult unless you have a child with like epilepsy or something like that, where the parents are managing everything. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, should a type one diabetic go on a ketogenic diet? Oh, another really good question. Wow. So, uh, you know, I've given lots of talks and like in the beginning of my talks, I'd say, whatever you do, if you're a type one diabetic, absolutely do not do the ketogenic diet, you know, because of diabetic ketoacidosis. So in 2015 or 15, I think I had a student join the lab and he was a, a Judy Genshaft presidential fellow, <laughs> and he was all fully paid for, very smart student. His name is Dr. Andrew Kutnick. Now he's a doctor, but he had type one diabetes and he had many close calls in the lab. And one of them, I remember my students ran and came, said Andrew's in trouble and his head was down and he was basically going into like a coma and he was type one diabetic because he was taking in sugar pills, eating carbohydrates, and his glucose was like this all day. And he's trying to offset it with injecting insulin. And he transitioned to a ketogenic diet and he wears a continuous glucose monitor and his glucose went from this to basically this super stable all day. His energy flow was better. Uh, he, you know, highest scores in the PhD program, super smart. Uh, now he works for a big diabetes center, but it was so inspiring. He ended up doing a TEDx talk on the topic of a type one diabetic. So his project in my lab was studying cancer cachexia or muscle wasting with cancer, but he was a type one diabetic. And I watched his transition from a carbohydrate based diet, which the American diabetes association recommends. He transferred to a ketogenic diet and his level of productivity, his energy levels, his body composition, everything improved remarkably. And he had the data to show it by all his continuous glucose data. <laughs> and he put all that data and made a, a TEDx talk that's gotten like, you know, hundreds of thousands of views now, and actually a lot of exposure. He actually uh, worked with, even met the president of the American Diabetes Association is doing a lot of work on the diabetes front. Uh, so he changed my mind, and then he connected with a group at Harvard, Dr. David Ludwig, and they published a paper on the use of a low-carbohydrate diet in type 1 diabetes. Is now There's several studies, Dr. Lennertz and Dr. David Ludwig from Harvard Medical School. So he connected and sort of inspired some of that. So I've changed my mind that with type 1 diabetes, like a ketogenic diet could be whenever you can use less insulin to manage your glucose, that's a good thing. So if a diabetes expert challenges you and said, there's no way a type one diabetic should be using a ketogenic diet, then you can kind of counter it and say, well, any diet that can help you optimize glycemic variability and actually cause you to use 80% less insulin at the same time, and you can show it with data and blood work, then I think, but not everybody can follow it. Sorry, it's a long winded answer to the question, but. Are there any other questions in the audience? No, I had, oh yes. While I'm walking over, I had a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that someone with mild cognitive impairment could be, um, could see improvement by going on the diet. What type of doctor would that person go and work with to get started on that road? Yeah, they would need to be a very open-minded doctor. <laughs> a doctor, so. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, Dr. David Perlmutter, he's a friend of mine, he's Dave down in uh, Naples, you know, he gave the keynote talk at our medical college a while back, he wrote the book, uh, Grain Brain. So if you're familiar with that, uh, you know, I'm sure he's pretty busy, but, uh, but, 
you know, I, I think the important thing is to go to, when people ask me a question, I always just tell them, go to PubMed. And some, you know, a lot of, a lot of the research is emerging. So I actually tell them to go to clinicaltrials.gov too. And because there might be clinical trials in this area that people could qualify for, but to actually get familiar with some of the overall reviews on this topic and then convince, you know, their doctor that we have to accept that nutrition has, it's not just nutrition. I mean, it's like sleep is super important, exercise, uh, light going out in the sun, scientists call that photobiomodulation, you know, light changes eye and things like that. So it's not, and it's synergistic. It's not, it's one plus one equals three, right? So if you do nutrition, that's going to have positive outcomes. If you do exercise, that's going to have positive, but if you do exercise in a high carb sugar diet, that can actually produce actually almost pre-diabetic, even in elite athletes. We just got a paper published last week on that high carb versus low carb athletes. So one plus one equals three. So if you do a dietary intervention, if you do engaging, creative, cognitive function, you know, sleep, sleep is super important to optimize sleep, all these things, but the nutrition is really like the big synergizer of all that. So it's really hard to get benefit. If you're doing very intense cognitive tasks, like brain training, and you don't have nutrition to support that, you're not going to get benefits from it. So, and I, I do think that a low carbohydrate diet, maybe not a ketogenic diet, my approach would be like a low carbohydrate Mediterranean diet type diet, and then adding MCT oil or ketone supplementation. So that would be like my general um, recommendation. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to break for lunch and for book signings. Thanks. Uh, I, I think you started to allude to this and I had to write my question down. I wrote it like four different times, but okay. So do you view a ketogenic diet as a metabolic hack that's supposed to be used in like very specific instances, or do you think that's just the way everybody should be eating? And really we went down the wrong path and I guess more of a standard diet. I know you said it's not very palatable. Is there an evolutionary reason why it's not palatable or, you know, that's going down a whole other rabbit hole, but I was just curious what your take was. Are, are we like all wrong and having my chocolate chip, uh, chocolate muffin this morning. I'm going to go to the gym later. So hopefully it's okay. But you know, what is your take on that? That's a good question. And it's a, it's an important question too, because I think we kind of lose touch about, uh, in regards to what we should be eating, you know, from not like we should definitely be eating like our, our caveman ancestors, but I don't, but the availability of carbohydrates and the type of carbohydrates just were not there back even like a hundred years ago. So what happens is that we have wild glucose fluctuations, insulin gets elevated, and this causes, I think not only metabolic problems, but also psychiatric problems too. I'm working on the field of metabolic psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Chris Palmer from Harvard has been on Good Morning America. You see, I'm, I'm leaving here today to go meet him and down in South Beach, Miami, there's a big metabolic psychiatry uh, area. And I think that our diet, which is high in sugar causes metabolic dysregulation. Now a ketogenic diet is so high in fat. It's unlikely that our ancestors would have been eating that high of fat, but I do think carbohydrate restriction and a low carb diet would fit in with more in line with what our ancestors and uh, and I think m most people looking to do a ketogenic diet, unless they have epilepsy or other disorders, which the standard of care is a ketogenic diet, they could just go to a low carb diet, which could be, you know, starting out under hundred grams a day of high fiber, you know, carb, and then work down to 50 to get ketones elevated. Um, so that's, I kind of went around your question, but, I, but I, yeah, it's a spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. D'Agostino. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs>